So I'm going to start with, uh, my name is Shane McLaughlin. I've been an outfitter inside of Yellowstone National Park since 2006. I've been a guide since 1990. Uh, so I've been in the park for 30 years. I've been a fishing guide in the park uh, for two thirds of that time. Uh, so I'm pretty comfortable with the park and the park waters and the fish of the park. And I'm, what I'd like to do tonight is share with you a presentation uh, about uh, fly fishing in Yellowstone. Uh, the thing about it is, is that fly fishing in Yellowstone, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. So I'm going to try to just keep it uh, kind of concise and just talk about a few things at a time. So I'm going to share my screen here and we are going to start on our presentation. So share that. Make sure everybody can see it. And start here. There we go. Now, everybody should be able to see that. So we're going to talk about backcountry fishing in Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone, we're fishing wild fish in wild places. And that's that's the big thing about being in Yellowstone uh, in the backcountry is you are in the wilds and it's a different type of fishing because of uh, the location. You're you are um, you're in a place where you can't just concentrate on your fish. You have to concentrate on lots of different things around you. Sorry. And that is something that you, <laughs> my wife's helping me out. So we are going to start on our first slide here uh, with an overview. <clears throat> so it's being in the backcountry. You really have to focus not just on the fishing, but on everything else around you. Otherwise you can get it yourself in trouble. But being back there is a different kind of fishing. It's a, it's a different experience. Uh, you're not shoulder to shoulder with other people. There aren't cars driving behind you. You are really in a wild place going after wild fish. And, uh, and it's a neat thing. So what we're going to do tonight, just to keep it kind of concise, is we're going to go into how does one get in the backcountry? Uh, what fish are in the backcountry? How do you be safe in the backcountry? And then what are some of the techniques for backcountry fishing? And, uh, and all those, any one of those could be a presentation in its own. But we're just going to kind of cruise through those kind of gently. So we're going to move through first. How does one get in the backcountry? In Yellowstone, you get in the backcountry in two ways. It's either by foot or by horse. And when you go back at there, uh, because it's a national park, and, and somebody uh, had said that we we work in the Bob Marshall, we don't. We work strictly inside of Yellowstone National Park. I'm not on the National Forest anywhere else. So the rules that I, I know for being in the backcountry are the Yellowstone National Park rules. And Yellowstone has its own kind of set of rules. But the basic rules are this. Don't make a mark. I mean, that's it. When you're back there, do everything you can not to leave anything behind. If you're going to camp back there, don't leave uh, scars on the ground, scars on the trees or anything like that. Uh, if you're fishing back there, don't leave your gear uh, laying in the bushes. You know, you cut your fly line and, and pitch it over your shoulder into a bush. You don't want to leave a mark. You always want to leave less uh, when you come out than what you went in with. So just, just be gentle on the land. Now, when it comes to fishing in the park, uh, there are uh, you got to get a fishing permit inside of Yellowstone. Your Montana or Wyoming or Idaho license doesn't work. It has to be a Yellowstone Park fishing permit. And they have a three-day permit, a seven-day permit, and a season. And the season uh, one is, I think last year's was 35 or 38 bucks. So it's not terribly expensive to get a season license to really go uh, spend some time in the backcountry. But if you decide, uh, let's say you want to go on a, a camping trip in the park, and you say, I really want to fish the park, but I don't want to spend that whole, you know, 35 bucks on a license. I just want to get a little three-day permit. You have to designate the days that you're going to fish it. So if you're planning where we're going to hike in the first day for a five-day trip, we'll fish the middle three days and then hike back out. You know, you have to pick those days and put them on your license. And the rangers are out. Um, and, the, you know, a lot of people look at the rangers as they're the bad guys. They're not the bad guys. They're the guys that we work with. I spend a lot of time having rangers come into my camp and check my camps, and they are they are friends uh, who come in and, and we we build relationships back there. So when we're back there, we want to you know when we're dealing with rangers, if we can say you know as they come up, volunteer, hey, do you want to see my fishing license? Hey, uh, how is your day? You know, have a good reaction with those or interaction with those rangers, and it makes your day better and it makes their day better and it makes them. Uh, less likely to be suspicious of you if you really just come in and, and say I'm here to enjoy the park and I love this place and I want to protect this place that's why they're there as well so work with your rangers when you see them but uh, they are they are out there and they're out there in, in force and you're like well there's not that many around but they they do check if they see somebody on the water 
they're going to ride down on their horse and check your license. That's just what they're going to do. So expect it. So carry it with you and be prepared. Uh, when you're in the park, uh, you can go in the park for a couple different ways. You can either go in as a day use. Uh, so you just hike in for the day, fish and come back out and then stay you know, in the cabins or in a campground or something. Uh, and then go just back and forth every day and fish the backcountry waters. Uh, or you can do an overnight trip. And if you decide to go overnight, it gets more complicated than just day use. With day use, you don't have to log in with anybody. You don't have to tell anybody where you're going. You just have to have that fishing license on you while you're back there. If you decide to go overnight and say, I, I really want to get more than just that hike away from the road, because there are a lot of other people who do the hike away from the road. And you can you can have some company while you're back there. But if you decide to get away from that extra company and get go overnight in the backcountry, then you need to have a backcountry camping permit. That's something you have to get ahead of time, uh, well ahead of time, lots of times, uh, because Yellowstone is a popular place. It's hard to get those backcountry campsites. Uh, you can reserve them sometimes just uh, 24, 48 hours ahead of time, sometimes months ahead. They have two different ways to do it. Uh, if you get it months ahead, uh, you know when you're going to be going, but it's kind of harder to draw. Uh, when you do it just the day before, you can go in and say, hey, is there just a slot? And you can grab one right away. So there's two ways to do it, but you got to have that backcountry uh, camping permit to go in the park. And Yellowstone has designated campsites. So to be in the backcountry near those good fishing waters, uh, there's a specific campsite you have to be in. And when you're in that campsite, there are some specific rules you have to follow. And the Park Service has a whole uh, video presentation that they'll have you watch when you pick up that camping permit. So you'll learn all the basic rules right there. And I could go through them. And if anybody has any questions about the rules in the park or the maybe just the rules you've heard, I've heard that you got to do this. I just ask and I'll tell you that can be part of your questions in the middle or at the end. Uh, so you need to have that uh, camping permit. You got to follow their basic rules. And then once you're back there, um, you just have to be wise. Just go back and, and have a good time and be wise. So this is how does one get in the backcountry by foot or by horse? Uh, make sure you have the right, right permit. Uh, you can go either day use or overnight. And if you go overnight, make sure you have a permit to do it and stay in a designated site. Next, what fish are in the backcountry? We're getting away from the roads and the crowds. We're getting into Yellowstone. Uh, and there, there are different fish in different places in the park. Uh, but the basic fish that are in the park is we have the native cutthroat, there's a West Slope cutthroat and a Yellowstone cutthroat. Uh, there's the Arctic grayling, which uh, has been pretty rare, but they're doing a lot of work to restore those fish in certain waters. So on Grayling Creek right now, the Arctic grayling has been restocked and is, is doing fairly well, last I heard. Uh, there's the natural mountain whitefish that are scattered here and there. And then there's the non-natives, which the rainbow trout, which are rainbow trout are native fish to western waters, but they weren't native to the high country areas. And they they have migrated up into places where they haven't used to be. Um, so now we're kind of dealing with some cross uh, cross contamination in, in some of our fish up there. Uh, there's the brook trout and the brown trout. And both of those two were stocked. They were stocked back in the uh, tens, twenties, and thirties, uh, just as a, a game fish. And everybody thought you should have these game fish out there to make the fishing better. And it was better, but it was hard on the native trout. So they're trying to remove those now. But there are certain waters in the park that they said, you know, it's a lost cause to try to remove these fish from everywhere. So they managed the park in a couple different ways. Uh, in the game waters where they say we can't, we can't get rid of those non-native fish, uh, they are, uh, they're just managing them uh, as species, so you're going to you have a certain take. You can take so many browns, so many brooks, so many uh, rainbows. Uh, you cannot take any of the native fish. Uh, so no cutthroat, no grayling, no whitefish. Those all have to be turned back out, uh, all catch and release. But uh, in the game fish areas, they, you can you can keep some. In other areas in the park where they're trying to restore those waters, the, it's mandatory that you take those game fish. So if you find a, uh, a rainbow trout up in Slough Creek or up in the Lamar, and you catch one, you are not allowed to put it back. You have to kill that fish. Uh, same thing down in Beckler. They want you to kill all the non-native uh, rainbows that you're catching in Becklers. So there's certain areas in the park where they're really trying to restore the waters to their native fish, and it's required that you keep those fish. Now, everybody asked me as an outfitter, they're like, oh, can we keep fish and bring them home for dinner? I'm like, sure, if you keep a, if you find a big old rainbow, bring it up for dinner. The problem is, is 
the park's doing a really good job. We don't catch that many rainbows. We almost never catch them. And sometimes we catch a cut bow. So it's got the rainbow look, but it's got an orange slash on its jaw. And they said, if it has an orange slash, put it back. Uh, uh, and that's what we run into most of the time. Rarely do we find a pure species rainbow, brook or brown in the wrong place. So they, uh, if it's, if it's crossbred, put it back because they don't want anybody to make a mistake. And kill the wrong fish. So if it looks like a you know a native fish, they say put it back no matter what, even if you see it has the you know the rainbow down the side. So those are the fish that are in the backcountry. We'll talk about where they're located a little more as we go along, but those are our general fish that we're fishing for inside of Yellowstone Park. Hey Shane, now, go right ahead. I'm gonna interrupt. I get we have some people that are trying to get into the meeting, and I guess there's a passcode. Um, so, so I'm going to reclaim hosting just for a second here and then give sure. you permission to reshare just so we can let some, some of those folks in. Um, yep. So I think, I think uh, I'll just mute myself and I think you can still present here uh, as is and I'll just, I'll just admit people as they come in. Sure, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Yep. All right. So once you're in the backcountry, the question is how do I stay safe in the backcountry and uh, what what we do is at the at the trailhead, when I first have my guests, uh, they meet us at the trailhead and we're getting horses and things ready for them. We, uh, we go over the five risks. And our first risk is the horse. You know, that's what we start with them with. But since you guys aren't guaranteed to be on horses, we're just gonna switch to a different risk for you. Um, but the first risk that we talk about is the water. You know, you guys are very familiar with the water. You're in the water uh, fishing. But what we tell people is that all the water in the park uh, can carry Giardia and Cryptosporidium. And those are two uh, microorganisms that are in the water. If you drink the water, they can bloom inside your system and make you very sick. Uh, and people are like, oh yeah, I've had that. Or, you know, and others are like, well, I've never had it and I've drank the water for years. Well, that's just the luck of the draw. You didn't get it. Uh, it is there and it can be gotten. And I know lots and lots of people who have gotten it. So you do have to be aware. But what what you need to be aware of is that you don't get it most of the time by taking a canteen and filling it up in the creek. Okay. And, I'm and then drinking it. Most of the time you get it off your fly line. When you, you catch your fish or you're you know, tying a new fly and you snip it off with your teeth, getting that just a few of those drops of water are enough for you to pick up that Giardia or Cryptosporidium and get very sick. And I've had guys in the backcountry who've been on multiple trips with me and they said they went home and said, yeah, I got it. And he said, I know you filtered all of our water for us. So it wasn't from you. He said, but I did pull my line up and cut it with my teeth, you know, all the time. That's what I always do. And he said, and I got it. So you were right. And he, he had the nippers on his vest from then on. He's like, I'm just going to cut it without, I'm not going to risk that ever again. Cause it's, uh, if you get Giardia or Cryptosporidium, it's like Montezuma's revenge with an attitude. It'll turn you inside out. You really have to uh, you have to do a lot to get rid of it. And it's it's a month or two months time to get yourself all the way back to normal again. So it's not something you really want to pick up. So that's the first thing in the water is, is that those bugs. Second thing in the water is Yellowstone waters change regularly. So uh, when you get out in the back country <coughs> and you're crossing the creek, uh, you do need to be aware that the water can be cold and swift. If you slip out there and fall down, and you fill your waders up with that cold water, you can get hypothermia very quickly. And you're like, well, I know that we do this, you know, all the time when we're fishing along the road. Well, the difference is that you're fishing all along the road and all you gotta do is get back to your car. When you're back there, you can get back to your camp and still have hypothermia. And if you don't have a buddy or somebody to help you out, you can get in real trouble. So when you're out there, you have to really be a lot more careful and a lot more wise about taking those risks when you're going across the creek and you're, you're out there fishing. Use your wading stick. And if you don't have one, pick up a stick out of the, the woods and use it as a wading stick. Give yourself that third leg to help you be steady while you're out there in water, just to be careful. So our first risk is the water. Second risk out there is the weather. A lot of people are, again, I fish in Montana. I know what it's like to go fishing outside, uh, but you do have to be aware that the weather, your uh, Yellowstone's, you know, fairly high. So uh, an afternoon thunder shower can blow in and you can get soaking wet and the temperature can drop down into the 40s and 50 degrees with the wind and you can get hypothermia in the middle of the summer. So you have to always take that rain gear with you. I always have a small jacket that I stick in my vest. And if you're gonna be away from camp, 
then you take your, your layers with you just to keep yourself warm and careful. The other thing is, is the opposite. You have to be careful of heat exhaustion. Uh, you're out there and you're hiking, you know, I really wanted to get that good fishing spot. So you're hiking down the trail. You didn't bring enough water with you and you get dry and then you're struggling because you're getting heat exhaustion. So you just have to be wise where you're out there. But the biggest risk is being out on the water when the afternoon thunder showers come in. And I know a lot of guys who told me, you know, I just really wanted to get that last fish. But when the lightning starts and you hear thunder, then you need to look around and and be aware uh, that you can be struck by lightning. You're carrying a lightning rod in your hand <clears throat> and it doesn't take very long that you're out there with that lightning rod that you can get hit. And one of the bigger killers of lightning strikes, I mean, people being struck by lightning, the biggest majority of them are often either alpine hikers who can't get any shelter and they're up on a ridge and it's fishermen who have that lightning rod in their hand and they wouldn't give it up uh, when the storms came through. Just break your rod down, fold it all up, go sit on the bank under a bush, let the storm blow by as soon as it blows by, go back out and keep fishing again. Uh, but don't keep that rod together. Take it apart and get it all small so that you're not gonna you're not gonna get struck. Your next risk uh, when you're out there is the wildlife. And everybody's like, man, you they ask everybody asked me the same question. Do you ever see grizzly bears? Yep, see them all the time. We deal with them and it's not a concern. We have uh, in the backcountry in our backcountry camps, we have mules and our mules are very defensive. They'll keep the bears away. Uh, our horses wear bells on them, so they're making lots of rackets, okay. so the bears know where we are, and they don't come into our camps. But your real threat out there, I mean, uh, when you're on the river, we tell everybody, be careful, carry bear spray with you, go always go out with, as a partner, you know, as a pair, two of you together. And when you're fishing, you know, be sure you're looking at each other. One guy looks, you know, I want to see that fish you're catching, and you're looking at the fish I'm catching, but we're also looking behind each other when we're looking at each other to make sure there's nothing coming up behind us. So it's good to be bear aware, but your big risk is these guys right here, these bison. The bison are laying down in the willows right along the edge of the river. It's hot out in the summertime and you don't even know they're there. You walk up behind one of those big willow bushes and a bison pops up and 1,500, 2,000 pounds of meat just stood up and got cranky and you, you can get in trouble fast. And they're very quick. Uh, I've had them off the ground and on their feet, you know, from a laying down position on their feet in a one to two seconds, they are, for being so large, they can get up really fast. So you have to be watching while you're walking along the river, you know, what is behind that bush? Make sure that it's, there's no bison laying back there and there's no bears back there. Cause lots of times they, you know, bears will take a elk carcass and they'll stuff it behind a, a willow bush and throw stuff on top of it. And then they'll sleep nearby cause they're full. Um, and those willow bushes are great places to hide things. So make sure that there's not a bear back there. Make sure there's not a bison back there. And then the other thing is, it's you know we have bears and bison, but there are there are wolves, there are mountain lions, there are lots of animals back there that you do have to be aware of while you're working and while you're fishing. So just keep your eyes out. The other thing is not just bison, but there's un other ungulates. So the elk, so there's elk, there's deer, antelope, all those kind of things. And it's not that they're a threat to you. It's always that surprise. You, you, you just get up on them and surprise them. And any one of them can be defensive. So you just have to be careful. So our first risk is the water. Second risk is the weather. Third risk is the wildlife. Then we have a number of poisonous plants. And these are like, well, really, I have to worry about the plants. There are just a few of them out there that are really poisonous. So there's one called monk's hood. Monk's hood is a tall purple flower, grows in the shade, grows where it's wet, marshy areas. Um, marshy areas where there's cover. It likes the shade, it likes it cool and wet. Monk's hood is so poisonous that even if you touch the plant, if you were to walk by and say, oh, this is a pretty flower and you were to pick it and hold it in your hand, that is enough for you to take the poison in through your skin and it can, it can make you very sick, not lethal just from touching it, but if you were to get it on your hands and then you know wipe it on your mouth or get it near your mouth, uh, just to ingest even one petal of monk's hood uh, can kill you in three minutes to three days. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. So it's one that you should be aware of while you're out there. The other one is lupin. We see lupin all the time. It's a beautiful flower. And larkspur, great big tall flower. Uh, both of them are dark, light and dark purple. The purple flowers are the poisonous flowers. So just, just make sure you avoid those guys while you're out there. So there's lots of poisonous plants, but those three are kind of the big ones you have to be uh, aware of. 
And then the fifth risk is what I tell everybody is the hardest risk and it's the unknown. When you leave the trailhead and you walk around the bend, they can no longer get emergency services to you. They can't get an ambulance. And once you're out there, when you make a mistake, they can become very costly. So I tell people it's best if you are more like my wife than like me. So when my wife and I, we look at a, an obstacle, I see a log there. I'm like, well, <clears throat> I can probably get over that log or walk along that log and not get hurt. And she looks at it and says, oh, I could get hurt by that log. I'm just going to go around it. And, uh, and she has been very good with no broken bones and I have broken 10 or 12. So it's, we just ask you to be wise while you're out there. Think hard before you do something and keep yourself safe. So those are the five risks. And there are lots more, but those are the big ones just to be aware of. So the next are, what are some backcountry techniques or some techniques for fishing backcountry fishing? Uh, so much of Yellowstone is, you know, to, to fish well in Yellowstone is finding the right place. So you gotta ask yourself, how adventurous am I? You know, how, how far in do I wanna go? The farther away from the road you get, the less fishing pressure there is and the better the fishing can be. Uh, that's, that doesn't hold true for everywhere. There are some waters in the park that used to be great fisheries and are very remote and they're not anymore. And it's not anything that people did, it's just natural you know, things that have happened that the fishery died out. So, uh, but most of the time, the farther away from the road you get, the better the fishing is. Um, but also the farther away from the road you get, the more planning it takes. You have to really organize and, and plan things out for you to go back, stay overnight, stay overnight, three or four nights. Um, the planning for the food, the planning for the, uh, the permits, planning, you know, the big planning is which flies do I take? And it never fails. You get back to go, oh, I wish I had that fly. Um, and, and you can't take them all. I mean, I've, I've had guys come on trips and they bring a suitcase full of flies. Well, I just don't want to miss out. Well, I'm sorry, uh, we can't take everything on a mule, uh, so you got to kind of cut down. So uh, do the research, find the areas, uh, learn about them, ask fishing guides, ask other people about who fished up there, and find out what's good for that area. Uh, and then the next question is, how uh, tough of a trail am I willing to take to get there? Uh, there sometimes it's distance. I, I got to walk 12 miles to get to that fishing spot. There are other ones where it's only two miles, but you got to walk two miles straight uphill and gain a thousand foot elevation. Um, so, you know, you got to figure out how, how willing am I to get to those places. The next thing is, is fishing for the place. Determine the water levels. Again, water levels in the park change fast. And uh, there are certain places, like I like to go in to fish Cash Creek. Cash Creek's a, good, a great place to fish. It's off the Lamar. It's about seven, eight miles into where we go. Uh, Cash Creek is great uh, early July, or July to mid-July even a little bit toward late July, but it doesn't take but three, three weeks, four weeks, and the water starts to drop. And a lot of your big fish that are in there migrate out. Um, that's, that's that way for lots of waters in the park. So figure out what areas hold fish early, what areas hold fish late, uh, what's the water levels, who uh, going in the Lamar. I love to go into Lamar, but that's not one I like to go into in July, uh, because even though it's good water, uh, we get a lot of thunder showers in July, and the river blows out really easy. Uh, Lamar's one I tell folks if you sneeze at it it'll turn to chocolate milk so you just have to be aware that's one that we should probably hit you know September be really good uh, to get in there when the water levels have kind of dropped and are steady and we don't have a lot of those afternoon thunder showers. So determine the water levels of the creek you want to go creek or river you want to go hit and see what's the best time to get there. <clears throat> Again, many of the waters in the park are prone to siltation, and a lot of it is in that uh, northeast corner. Uh, so Pebble Creek can silt and blow out easy. Uh, the Lamar blows out well. Uh, Cash Creek and Miller Creek both can blow out. So all those, and once they go, then the Yellowstone goes. I mean, you can see when there's a storm in, the Yellow, uh, in Yellowstone Park and you're down by Livingston, you know uh, when the storm was because all that mud's going to eventually come through. So that all comes from certain areas in the park. Other areas are less likely to blow out. Like Slough Creek has a lot of grasses along the edge and siltation. It can discolor some, but it doesn't usually blow completely out. Uh, places over in the Northwest corner are similar to that. There's a lot of good uh, grasses along the edges that keep it from silting up. So there's some good places to fish even when it is strong. So keep an eye out on the areas uh, and how they, how they silt <clears throat> and how they are uh, depending on their water levels. 
Uh, the next, oops, I'm going to go back one. The next question that you got to ask yourself is when I'm thinking about fishing is what bugs are good for that area? Um, <clears throat> there are certain places in the park where it's best to match the hatch and there are other places where it's really just attractor patterns. Uh, determine what kind of fly I really want to fish the area with. Uh, Slough Creek is one where everybody loves to go into slough. Everybody wants to go into slough because it has great big cutthroat trout. Uh, it's good clear water so you can look down in there, see the fish swimming. You can stand there and watch 10 fish moving up and down in a pool and all of them are 18 to 20 inches long. I mean they're great big fish, really beautiful, but uh, some days they are really particular on what fly they're going to eat and they'll only eat what's hatching. So, you know, there are days that I've gone through my whole fly box and I couldn't get them to come up and even look at anything. Uh, and it turns out they're eating like a microscopic midge. Well, they're eating something that was just hatching right below the surface of the water and I couldn't tell what it was. So you had to go through every nymph in your fly box until you found the right one. And it can be size specific. Sometimes they're eating those teeny weeny guys and you can't even see them, but you can see the fish come up and sip something, but you don't know what they're sipping. So you just got to work, uh, you know, guess and check. But in some places it's match the hatch. Lots of times up in the Lamar though, uh, which is the same fish are in the Lamar as they are in, in Slough Creek. Those, those waters are uh, connected. Uh, you're up in the headwaters of the Lamar. You can throw anything at them on some days and they'll take it. It's, it's hopper patterns. It's uh, any of the attractor patterns, any of those things. They, you know, they're just hungry fish at certain days. Uh, so it depends, kind of learn the area. Again, talking to the guides who've been up there and asking them what works in that area and then going for it. I know up in uh, the Lamar and in Miller Creek, there's a pink bellied grasshopper that hatches up there. And I, you know, you walk along and pick them up off the ground and they have a little pink stripe down their side. And boy, you have the right pink bellied grasshopper in your box and they'll go crazy for it. And you have, you know, a Joe's hopper or some other hopper that's, that's more just plain yellow they don't want it, they won't touch it. So sometimes it's, you know, that specific. Other times, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it's it's good to know what, what bugs are hatching up there and when they're hatching up there. So talk to your local guides and find at, you know, the time of the year, what works best. So those are some of your uh, techniques for backcountry fishing. And then, you know, up here it says, so much of, of fishing well in Yellowstone is finding the right place. So to find the right place, Yellowstone is 2.4 million acres and finding the right place to fish uh, for you is, is, you know, that's your challenge. Uh, where, where can I go that I can really catch the fish I want to catch? If you want to catch great big rainbows, a great place to go is down into Beckler Meadows. If you're looking for hundreds of little cutthroat that are about 14 inches, um, go up into, into Cash Creek or up into the, into the upper um, Beckler Canyon. Uh, so there's certain places for certain fish. So what, what I'm going to do now is just kind of go through the areas of the park and what the area looks like and what fish are there. So we're going to start in the Beckler region. That's the southwest corner. A lot of people are like, well, I've never really even heard of the Beckler region. Well, the Beckler River runs down into the Cave Falls River, and uh, the way you access the park is, is that part of the park is in two ways. One, you can come in from Old Faithful and go over, um, what is that, Douglas Knob, um, Grant Pass uh, by Lone Star, Lone Star Geyser along the backside of the Shoshone Lake, and then up over uh, Grant Pass and then down into the head of the Beckler River Canyon and then come out uh, at the bottom. Or you can drive all the way around through Idaho Island Park and go down into Ashton, Idaho. And from Ashton, Idaho, you drive up into the Beckler Rangers, Ranger Station. So it's not real easily accessible. Once you get to the Ranger Station, you got to park and then walk, I don't know, what is it, four or five miles. Uh, well, probably not that. There's other places that are a little closer. You can get in there as, as short as three miles. So an hour's walk will get you in to hit the first part of the Beckler Meadows. But Beckler Meadows are huge and there's lots of Beckler River in there, Boundary Creek's in there. Lots of waters in there that you can fish, uh, but that's the first region we're going to talk about. So the Beckler River region, uh, it looks like this is a view from the Beckler Meadows. Uh, you can see the backside of the Tetons from there. It's a, it's a gorgeous place, but it's big wide open meadows with these strips of timber running through them. And, and it's the problem with Beckler Meadows is it's easy to get lost in there. You get in those strips of timber and you lose sight of the Tetons and you can get turned around because it's just flat and uh, you can get lost pretty easy. So really keep an eye out on where you are, keep an eye on where the Tetons are, and that'll help you keep, 
keep track and, and try not to lose the trail. Uh, what we're catching in there, well, that's what we're catching in there are those big rainbows. That first picture was caught right there in the Beckler Meadows. Uh, from the Beckler Meadows, you follow the Beckler River and head up the Beckler Canyon. And you're like, all right, are you saying Beckler? Uh, a lot of people read that word and say it's Belcher, B-E-L-C-H-E-R. And that's not right. Beckler was a, he was with the Washburn, or not the Washburn, but with the Hayden Expedition. He was a cartographer. And when he was in there, they named the area after him. So it's an odd word, but it's it's because it's a guy's last name. So you go up the Beckler uh, River through the meadows into the Beckler River Canyon. And what you're fishing here, you can see uh, the Beckler region is called the Cascade Corner of Yellowstone Park. Uh, there are tons and tons of waterfalls in there. Uh, for a simple ride, we ride uh, from Beckler Meadows up the canyon and going up the canyon, you pass nine waterfalls in about seven miles. And the waterfalls are, some of them are as big as 150 feet. Uh, some of them you're on the brink of 114 feet drop. You're right on the edge. The mist is blowing over top of you. It's a, a neat place to be. But when you're fishing that, I, there are stretches where the water's uh, just a cool, calm channel. And then a lot of it looks like this, a lot of this white water. And this white water surprisingly holds a lot of fish. All these little plunge pools have fish in them and nobody's fishing them. Everybody thinks that it's, you know, fishless because it's a fish barrier. There's no fish up there. And that's not true. Uh, there are tons of places that you can fish on your way up the Beckler River Canyon. And, the, and what you're catching there is anywhere from six to 16 inch cutthroat. It's almost all native cutthroat up through here. And I, I dry fly, I mean, most of the summer, it's all dry fly fishing. We, we will nymph occasionally, but most of the time, the conditions are right that you can dry fly fish the whole time. And this is a beautiful place to dry fly fish. So the Breckler River Canyon. Uh, feeding into the Breckler River Canyon is uh, Boundary Creek. This is Denanda Falls. And I'm telling you, there's waterfalls everywhere. In every direction you look, there's a waterfall. So this is Denanda, Denanda Falls. Uh, again, here you're catching, uh, you get into some brooks, brook trout and some rainbows. Uh, not a lot of cutthroat below the falls. Above the falls, you would find more. And then uh, this is Mountain Ash Creek. And again, waterfalls everywhere. This actually is a, a warm water. There's a hot spring not too far away from here that feeds into this. So this water is warm. But even though the waters are warm, you know, lots of times you hear warm water is bad for the fish. The fish are still here. They, they have learned to adapt and they do find it. So the, there's, there's hot springs in, in numerous places in this region. Uh, so this is this is the Beckler River region, and and in uh, Mountain Ash Creek, you're often fishing for a decent sized brook trout. There's a lot of brook trout in here. Now the northwest corner. So you start at the southwest corner. We're going to go straight north, past the Madison. Now we're, there's lots of waters I'm not going to talk about because it's all along the road. I'm going to skip the whole Madison region, uh, the Gibbon Ribbon, the Gibbon River, the Fire Hole, all that stuff you can get from the road. So we're gonna jump over that and get back up to the backcountry waters up in the Northwest corner. So up there we have Fan Creek, the Gallatin River, Specimen Creek, and then a couple of lakes that are up high. So we'll start at Fan Creek. Uh, Fan Creek uh, is, is like this. It's a smaller stream, lots of brush, lots of things hanging over it. Uh, there are some good cut banks. Uh, because of that brush, there's good cover. So you get some nice uh, rainbows up here. We get a lot of nice rainbows up here. Uh, uh, but this is one that can be, it's a hard one to fish. Uh, it's, it's good fishing on some days and other days you get skunked. And I, I haven't yet figured out the pattern. We've had some great days where we were catching 18 inch rainbows up there. And there are other days where we fished all day and, and, and caught two, two to eight inches and that was it. There's some good, uh, there's a lot of beaver in here. So there's some good beaver ponds to fish. There's also a lot of wildlife in here. I've run into more moose here than I've run into anywhere. Uh, so do be aware when you're in these willows, uh, I watched a, a good eight foot tall moose walk into the willows and completely disappear. You wouldn't have known he was in there. So do be aware of them while you're here. Uh, but that's Fan Creek. Uh, from Fan Creek, uh, this is one of the rainbows they caught out there, good sized fish. Now, this guy was from Scotland. He hadn't fished very often. So you can tell he's hugging his fish. He really loves this guy. Uh, what was nice is he didn't squeeze it too hard. So when we released it, it took off like a shot. It was a good healthy fish when we turned it loose. Uh, this is the upper Gallatin region. Uh, back up over <clears throat> behind the horses and to the right is Bighorn Pass. Uh, the, and below Bighorn Pass is the Gallatin Lake. And that's where the headwaters of the Gallatin River comes from. Uh, you can't actually get to Gallatin Lake because it's in the uh, grizzly bear uh, protected area. 
So they call it grizzly bear management. You have to stay on the trail there. Uh, but that is, there is a lake up there. I'm sure there's fish in that lake because the river comes out of that lake and there's fish in the river. So there's got to be something up in there. But I've never been able to get to it because it's grizzly bear management area. But uh, the upper Gallatin, you fished it along the road. You get up away from the road. It's, it's just as good a fishing up here as it is along the road. The difference is, again, there's less people. Um, so he caught himself a nice uh, 12 or 13 inch rainbow up in here. It's a pretty place to fish. And these, there are lots of gravel bars in there. So there are places where it's crystal clear, uh, just grass along the shores, and it's almost fishless. But you get into other places, you get in some deep pockets and pools, a lot of brush hanging over the edges, and that's where you're really going to pick up your fish. So you get in there. Um, so right at the parking area, you want to walk in a good three, four miles before you get into those places where you're really going to catch some fish. And what's nice is you go a little a mile further and there's a campsite. You can set up a backcountry camp there and stay and fish the Gallatin River. Uh, then we have High Lake and Sportsman's Lake. They're both high altitude lakes, uh, captive cutthroat populations. 13 miles into one, uh, 11 miles into the other, it's one where you're going to want to camp and stay to go fish those. So that's the northwest corner. And then we're going to move to the northeast corner. That's Slough Creek, Pebble Creek, the Lamar, Cash Creek, Miller Creek, and Cold Creek. Uh, these are all uh, in that uh, northeast corner on either side of the road that runs up to Cook City. Uh, Pebble Creek, Slough Creek are north of the road. Lamar, Cash, Miller, and Cold Creek are south of the road. Uh, these are your, this is your classic uh, Slough Creek cutthroat. Uh, it's a beautiful place. This is Pebble Creek. Uh, Pebble Creek, this is my daughter uh, fishing her first time up there. She caught a ton of little fish in there. Um, uh, so Pebble Creek has smaller fish. It gets fished. Uh, it, because it's only three miles from the road, it, it can get kind of fished uh, by day use, but it's three miles straight uphill. So it, it cuts down a lot of traffic to get in uh, just that three mile section. Uh, but a lot of people ride in there. So you'll, you'll get some guest ranches who do day rides, fishing day rides in there. So you do get a little bit of traffic, but it's not bad. That's another place to go in, camp and stay and fish it. There's lots of water up there to fish and there's a lot of good fish in there. Uh, this is common size of them. These are uh, this little brown trout they're catching. <clears throat> so you catch browns and some rainbows in there and maybe a few cuts, but uh, the browns were the most common. Okay, this is the Lamar. So that was uh, that was the Lamar back there. Uh, that's what the it's a so Lamar is it can be canyon like. It can also open up into meadows. Lamar has beautiful, nice, big fish in there. The difference between Lamar and Slough, Slough, the fish are all concentrated. The Lamar, there's distance between them. So you fish and catch a pot of fish in this you know canyon like where he's sitting right here. He's on the edge of a pool on a cutback in a canyon, and then you walk. Uh, quarter mile to the next pool and you catch another bunch of fish in that one. Whereas slew, it's the fish after fish after fish after fish, they're all right there close, but they're also much more, uh, they've been fished a lot more, they're a lot more wily. Um, it's a lot harder to catch them. These guys are, have been fished less, but you gotta walk more to catch them and the river can blow out. So it's a risk. This is another backcountry place where you wanna get in, set up a camp and stay. But if the river blows, it takes three days to clear. And that's the luck of the draw of going in the Lamar. Uh, this is in Cash Creek. Cash Creek is, uh, it's a smaller, again, a smaller stream, lots of grass on the bank, but it can still blow out because you can see the mountains up here. These are all uh, erosionary mountains, so they do silt in uh, pretty easy. Uh, this is the type of fish you're catching up in the Cash Creek. You get some decent sized fish in there. Probably the biggest I've ever seen up there is about a 16 incher. Um, the eights, six eights, tens are pretty darn common. And it's, and again, not fished very often, so it's a good place to go. First camp for backpackers is about three, four miles in. Stock sites are about seven or eight miles in. Uh, this is Miller Creek, riding into Miller Creek. Uh, this is what they call Appaloosa Meadows. And there are some, because Miller is a feeder of the Lamar, once you get into the bigger waters closer to the Lamar, you get in some decent sized cutthroat down there. Uh, and it's a it's a nice place to fish, but again, silts out easy. You can, if you can see in the water, you can see there's this fine silt layer over all the rocks. When the water speed picks up, that all stirs up, and the whole thing blows out pretty easy. And the next is up. This is Cold Creek Junction at the head of the Lamar. The Lamar is actually a very long river. It folds around and runs back this other direction a ways. 
uh, but it's not, it gets pretty skinny up there. So the fish are much smaller. It's not really great fishing past that Cold Creek Junction. Uh, but here, again, it's very remote. This is about 16 miles in. Uh, and it's a great fishery, big fish, nice fish, uh, beautiful. So this is a friend of mine catching a beautiful cutthroat up there. And then central Yellowstone River. Uh, there's Hellroaring Creek and the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone. Black Canyon is a great place to fish. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic in there. You got to go across a suspension bridge on either end of it to get in there. Uh, so that kind of limits the horse traffic in there. Uh, the distance is about, uh, it's probably four miles to the camp right here. And then the other camps in the middle are another three or four miles long. So it's seven or eight miles to get in there and stay in camp. Uh, but there's big, nice fish in the Yellowstone. Again, the Yellowstone will blow out if the Lamar blows out. So you have to be aware of that. Now, southeast corner, this is where a lot of people say, that's where I want to go. I want to get down in the thoroughfare. The thoroughfare used to be an amazing fishery. And I say used to be because uh, it's now kind of on the recovery side. Uh, it, there are some big fish down in there, but there aren't the numbers that there used to be back. Oh, 2001 to 2010 was the heyday. There are so many pack trains going down in there. And you'd catch, I mean, tons of big, you know, 24 inch cutthroat. I mean, that's a big cutthroat. Uh, and they were down there and you'd catch numerous fish that size. And now there's, there's a few pods of resident fish down there, but you're not finding the numbers that used to be. That's blamed on siltation, forest fire, lots of different things. Uh, it was kind of the perfect storm of things that, that hampered that fishery. The other thing is this is above the lake. So the fish come out of the lake to come up here to spawn. Lake trout hit them hard. Uh, there was also some silt dams that also uh, hampered them. So there's a lot of things that, that hurt the fishing population up here. Uh, but it's a beautiful place to go and there still are some fish, uh, but don't go down there thinking that it's, you know, it's the heyday that it used to be. There's still rumors running around, it's the best place to fish. And it used to be the best place to fish. It's not the place to, to go now, but it's still a great place to go see. And if you have an opportunity to, to fish it down there, you can. The Snake River is one that you can still fish. <clears throat> uh, you, there are two or three different ways to hit the snake. The snake runs quite a ways through the south uh, east corner, and it's a good fisher yet. Uh, you can hit one of them. I'm trying to think of the trailhead that's up there. It's by Heart Lake. Yeah, the Heart Lake trailhead. You can hike in from there to, to Heart Lake, and then the um, the Snake River runs back in behind Heart Lake. So that's one, one way you can get it. Uh, there's another one right down here is another place where you can uh, hit it. This is the south entrance. There's a trailhead right at the south entrance and you follow the south boundary trail, takes into, uh, into the Snake River. So both of those uh, are access points to get into the snake. And the snake has uh, decent rainbows. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice nice fishing stream or a nice fishing river. <coughs> And then uh, this is fishing on, this is about 12 miles in to a different point on the Snake River and another good place to fish. Uh, this is way down in the thoroughfare. So this is the upper Yellowstone River and uh, the Yellowstone, again, there are some big pockets uh, along the, some big bends and they hold fish that are big resident fish, but you're not finding the numbers in between. So you find a pocket here and a pocket there but you're not finding lots and lots of fish like there used to be. And they're all the same size. You don't find, you find a few small fry and then you find these great big 23 inch fish, but you don't find, you know, the tens, 12s to 18s. There's nothing in the middle there, which says that there's a problem with the population. And once those big older fish, you know, die out, there may not be, there aren't replacements. And that's something that's concerned the park service and they're looking at doing. Uh, this is the Yellowstone River uh, just above the lake. So you get down and there's some beautiful log jams. You think about the number of fish that could be under a log jam like that. Uh, it's just fantastic. Um, but again, are there any fish there right now? Last time we were in there, there weren't, it was a surprise. This is right on Yellowstone Lake. You used to be able to stand on the edge of the lake and fish, you know, cast out there and pull uh, the cutthroat that used to be in the lake. Uh, you could fish, you know, hundred yards off the lake and there'd be lots of fish out there. Now those numbers are way down because of the lake trout. The lake trout stay out deep, so you can't catch them from the shoreline, uh, but they, the numbers are coming back. So we're starting to see some cutthroat again along the lake shore edge. Again, it's catch and release, uh, but you're not gonna find the numbers like you used to. 
Now, that's the presentation. I have my, my ending here. Let me explain, no, let me sum up. Uh, the takeaways are if you're gonna go in Yellowstone, uh, prepare, get your permits, know the rules, know your risks, pick your species and where you wanna go, and then go out there. Go out and explore, see that backcountry. There's a ton of backcountry to see. I've been working in there for 30 years and I still haven't seen everything I wanna see. You can fish Yellowstone for the rest of your life and never get bored. So have a good time and keep your lines tight. Are there any questions? Shane, first off, uh, thanks for a great presentation. That was an awesome rundown of various areas of the park and, and I'm sure it gets a lot of people excited for summer and uh, starting to get permits here this time of year. We had a couple uh, questions pop up in the chat. The first one was, how do you prepare for mosquitoes and or other bugs on, in, on backcountry trips in the park? The nice thing about the backcountry, it is not as buggy as you would think it is. Uh, one, so when we go into Slough Creek, which there's a lot of standing water in Slough, uh, down on the, on the stream, you're dealing with some horse flies and deer flies. Uh, just wear, I wear quick dry pants that are long. I don't go out there with bare legs and a lightweight shirt, and I don't have a lot of trouble with them. Uh, in the evenings in the camps, we pack in a, a big wall tent size screen tent, screen tent. There's no frame, it's just the, the bug netting material. So have a, a bug net that you can set up and the bugs are, the mosquitoes are bad morning and evening, middle of the day when it's, when it's warm out, they're not as bad as you would think. Uh, the deer flies, horse flies, those bother the horses a lot more than they bother us most of the time. But again, wearing a lightweight shirt, uh, not having your skin exposed most of the time, and it's not bad. But a lot of it is knowing where to go and when to go. So you never go in the Beckler before, August, second or third week of August. Uh, I mean, well, that's not true. I don't take my horses in there before the, the first or second week of August because the horse flies will carry them away. Uh, the mosquitoes are miserable July uh, up through the middle of July in, in Beckler. So there's some places I just don't go because the bugs are too bad. Uh, there are other places to fish until the bugs drop. So there are certain areas in the park that you go early. Uh, you can get into the northwest corner early. That's good for the first couple weeks of July. The bugs aren't bad there. Uh, once you get into that second week of July, they start to hatch and they get tough. But you remember, they're not the only bugs who are hatching. So that same time, the other bugs that you want to have out that the fish are really going to feed on are hatching as well. So just, again, keep your skin covered. If you need to, put a mosquito net, net over your hat uh, just to help keep them off your face. I've never really had to do that except when I was down in, in Beckler one time where spring was late and the bugs lingered on longer than it normally do. Uh, another question that came in is whether there's a uh, kind of an overarching river and creek map for the park that you utilize or would recommend for folks. Um, I don't have an app. I actually just got my first smart, <laughs> smartphone uh, last week. Oh, I so, <laughs> okay, I'm in, uh, it's always been a map in my hands to know where I'm going or the map in my mind and talking to other people about where good places to fish. I'm sure there's an app out there. <clears throat> just They have a wildlife app. When you're in Yellowstone, you can see where what animal has been sighted by the road by keeping track of this app, and then everybody rushes to that spot if you're close to it. I, I apologize. The question was about maps, and I may have had some poor audio call. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, is it so a good map? Uh, actually, it's a good book is the best thing. It's by Craig Matthews. It's Fly Fishing Yellowstone Park, and that tells you what fish are where and good times to go go there and uh, what flies to use in the area. So that that's really the best resource, I think. Great. Another question, we got a, a bunch that piled in here at the end, um, uh, asking if the outfitters provide drop camp services rather than guiding, cooking, et cetera. Uh, there are some, There's there are 40, well, we're down to about 40 contracts in the park. A bunch of those are guest ranches. So there are a number of outfitters who work certain areas in the park uh, and they do do drop camp services. Now, the hard part is they're usually pretty busy. So if you want to do that, that's something you want to let them know really early, like January, that you want to do a trip into the park. And they there's lots of them who will do that drop camp service. We do as well. <clears throat> and another one that came in is, how's the fishing in Heart Lake? Uh, it's been good. I mean, it's it's still, so Heart Lake had lake trout early on. And the, that's one of the fishing ecosystems that has balanced out. Now, a lot of guys will come up there and they'll take a float tube 
and get out in the middle and they'll fish for the lake trout. They'll fish deep. Uh, the fly fishing, uh, there's some, you can fish around the shores, but it helps to have something to get away from the shore a little bit to, to work on some of those cutthroat. Uh, the problem out there is the winds can pick up and the, the lake can turn really choppy really fast. So you do have to be careful while you're out there. Got it. And then uh, another question uh, is, what is the uh, weight limit per angler on a trip? Weight limit per angler, uh, per, 15 pounds. Per equipment. Yeah, sorry, I didn't clarify that. Yep, so 15 pounds of fishing gear and uh, about probably 15 to 18 pounds of personal gear as well. Got it. Another... With us, we provide everything. So all you're bringing is your clothes and your toothbrush. Uh, you know, we have all the sleep bags and all the gear. Another question that popped up here is if you do the Fall River ever. Football River? The, the Fall River over in Idaho. Oh, the Falls River. Gotcha. Uh, the Fall River. No, because that's one you can access by the road. Got it. Um, another question about uh, what emergency equ equipment should each angler bring on a trip? Always bring an emergency locator beacon of some sort. If you're going to be back there for overnight or longer, uh, that is one of the best things you can. There's several different ones out there. Uh, we used to use the spot device. We now use the Garmin in reach device. Uh, both of those are, are useful. Um, but if you're going to be back there, make sure you have something that if you get hurt, uh, you can get somebody to come in and get you. Uh, the other thing is bring a basic first aid kit. I mean, you're going to, and something that at least carries band-aids and blister kit. Uh, most of the time, your real problems are you got blisters so bad on your feet from hiking in and your fishing boots that you can't get yourself back out. Uh, so make sure you have something to take care of your feet and, uh, and bring uh, an emergency, one of those lightweight emergency blankets, the reflector kinds, in case you get hypothermia. Those are, again, super lightweight. There's, you can make a nice light pack for being down on the river or being in the backcountry. Uh, made up with with light gear that will protect you with the basic stuff. So basic first aid kit, uh, emergency beacon, and uh, and uh, the blanket. Those are some of the just light basic things that will get you a long ways. Got it. And we've got two last questions here. Um, one person asked, if there's a medical emergency on one of your trips, how do you get an angler out? Well, same way you got in, by foot or by horse. If it gets real bad, then it's a helicopter. And we carry our emergency beacon with us that if we have to call in a helicopter, we can. We never have, <clears throat> in all the years that I've worked in the park, I've never had to airlift anybody out. Um, and I've actually only had to take a, a wrangler out who, who fell, uh, his horse fell off a cliff. Luckily, it was a short cliff. Um, and he, he got a concussion and we had to take him out. And he'd already had a concussion, otherwise... Uh, I don't think it would have been an issue. I think it's because he hit his head twice so many times in a row uh, that well, he was a bull rider, just so you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so that that was the issue. He, but that that's what it takes is we had by foot, by horse or by helicopter. And it, it rarely happens. Uh, one more question here. Uh, is there a weight limit for clients that are going to be on a horse? Our horses, uh, any horse can carry a quarter of its weight. Most of the time your saddle horses are a thousand pounds to uh, 1200 pounds. So we have, we set our weight limit at 250. And then one, one more just popped up here. Sorry. There's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, do you give anglers a checklist prior to uh, bringing them on the, on a trip in the park? Yep. Yeah. We send out a checklist with everything they need. Great. Um, I think that wraps it up for our questions. Um, thank you again for all the time and preparation into, into presenting this, especially on zoom and in the unique times. Um, we appreciate, uh, all the time tonight and, and, uh, <clears throat> the depth of knowledge you have on the park.